we see scripture after scripture after scripture that tells us the way of salvation. And it is not by our works. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 states, it is by faith, you, it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not from yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So that's part of the doctrinal statement of the church. And if you think you can work your way into heaven, you're in the wrong church. Because we do not believe that. That is satanic. And you think you can work your way into heaven, you are out of line. And why can I say that? Because scripture after scripture says so. John 3.15 That everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. Also John 3.18 He who believes in him is not judged. But he who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the unique person of the Son of God. And I make this very clear because your soul, your salvation is dependent upon one thing and that is faith alone in Christ alone with nothing added to it. If you add to faith, you're not going to go to heaven. And I can tell you that because there are Jews who live very moral lives and they're going to hell because they have never believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. And there are Muslims who live very moral lives and yet they have never believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. You cannot go to heaven because you're moral. Morality has nothing to do with getting into heaven. But what does, but what it, you get to heaven by faith alone in Christ alone. John 3, 36. He who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not believe in the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. The issue in salvation is whether you believe in Christ or not. And that is the only issue there is in salvation. And no other. John 11, 25, Jesus said to her, and he was talking to Martha, and he said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me shall live, even if he dies. And notice that it is belief, 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 nothing added to it. And you say, well, what about that verse that says, repent and believe? And you think repent means to feel sorry for your sins. Well, there is an original language to the Bible. It's not English. It's called Greek. Greek and Hebrew in the Old Testament. And in the Greek, the word repent is trans... It's, uh, the Greek word is metanoieo. And if you don't believe me, get a Greek Bible and look it up. Metanoieo. And that means to have a change of mind. It does not mean to feel sorry for your sins. And what does it mean? Repent and believe. It means have a change of mind about Christ and believe in Him. Your emotions, adding your emotions to anything with uh, faith, is going. It means you're not saved. You are only saved by what Scripture says. And what does Scripture say? John 11:25. Jesus said to Martha, "I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me shall live, even if he dies." And John 11:26. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. So Jesus makes it clear that He is the only way of salvation. There is no other way. There is no works you can do to get yourself into heaven. Jesus did it all. Now that is our statement of faith out there on there. The faith alone in Christ alone. And if you don't believe that, then uh, the next few moments are going to be devoted to silent prayer. And if you don't believe that you are saved by faith alone in Christ alone, while we are during silent prayer, you can get up and leave and nothing will be said to you. And then we can continue with the study that we left off with last time. So the next few moments will be devoted to silent prayer. And this will give each of you as a believer priest, and we are priests as per 1 Peter 2.5 and 2.9. We are a kingdom of priests as per Revelation. And uh, as a kingdom of priests, we have the right to utilize in Scripture 1 John 1 9. And 1 John 1 9 states, and this is for believers, 1 John was written to those who have already believed in Christ. And everyone who has believed in Christ still sins. So there's no such thing as sinless perfection. And if you think so, you make God out to be a liar, as per 1 John 1 8 and 1 John 1 10. If you don't believe me, look it up. So 1 John 1 9 was made as a solution to that sin as believers, which states, if we name our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing. And that's what it says in the Greek. Homo legeo, 5th century B.C., Athens, Greek word, which means to name. They would get up in front of the court and they would name their sin. Now the Bible originally was written in the Greek. The Apostle Paul, by the way, did not speak English. He spoke Greek. And in the Old Testament, they spoke Hebrew. 
and Jesus Christ spoke Aramaic. And the original languages are extremely important when it comes to the Word of God, because when it comes to the Word of God, you must be accurate. So, the next few moments are devoted to silent prayer in which you can utilize 1 John 1, 9, which states, If we name our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit. And what is spirit? That is the filling of God, the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 4.30 says, uh, stop, or, or, or actually, there's a verse in the Bible that says, keep on being filled with God, the Holy Spirit. And the only way to do that is to make sure sin is not in the members of your body. And how do you do that? By utilizing 1 John 1.9. 1, so, uh, with the next few moments are devoted to silent prayer. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful opportunity this morning to live in freedom, to live in a country where we are free to assemble ourselves together and to learn the Word of God. And may we learn the Word of God and put it into our souls, because that is the only way that we can glorify you. Therefore, Father, may God the Holy Spirit give us the concentration, and may God the Holy Spirit enlighten us to the portion of the Scripture that we are going to study today, so that we might grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Now last time, on Thursday, we were studying the sin face to face with death. And that is found in 1 John 5, 16. The face to face with the sin face to face with death is found in 1 John 5, 16. The King James James says, the sin unto death and unto death really has, uh, it's an ambiguous meaning. What does unto death mean? Well, it's face to face. You come face to face with death. And it's found in 1 John 5, 16. Now, in the general context of this, we're talking about divine discipline. God disciplines His children. And all of us who have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ are children. And therefore, when we are out of line, when we're in a state of sin and when we live under perpetual carnality, and that means we are constantly under sin, God punishes us. That's why it says He stands at the door and knocks. And when He's knocking, that is divine discipline. That is the Lord trying to grab our attention to do what? To use 1 John 1, 9, to name our sins, which is the grace provision. And it is grace and if you don't understand grace, stick with this ministry long enough and you will. So the context is the general doctrine of divine discipline. Divine discipline is the sum total of punitive measures by which God judges, corrects, and teaches the believer in time. And that's point one. The context is the general doctrine of divine discipline. Divine discipline is the sum of total of punitive measures by which God judges, corrects, and teaches the believers in time. And if you want to, you can turn in your Bibles to Hebrews 12, 5 through 6. Hebrews 12, 5 through 6. And Hebrews is right here. It's talking about the divine discipline God gives to His children. And this is where it says, And so you yourselves have forgotten the principles of doctrine which teach you as a son. My son... Do not make light of discipline from the Lord, nor be thanking when you are punished by Him. For you see, whom the Lord loves, He punishes, and scourges alive with a whip every son whom He receives. In other words, all of us have within the members of our body, as the Apostle Paul says, an old sin nature. And sometimes the sin nature takes control of our souls. And when it does so, we are said to be out of fellowship. And when we are out of fellowship, that means that we are in line for some divine discipline. Now this Friday, I was going to tell you this earlier, this Friday is Good Friday. And most churches will probably be closed then, but I'm going to be here according to the Constitution. I can schedule a class whenever I want. So I'm going to, on Friday... I'm going to be here. It will be a two-hour, the break, message. 
and why am I doing that? My handwriting has improved greatly. <laughs> <laughs> it sure has. <laughs> All right, priority number one in life. Now that says daily cognition of Bible doctrine with emphasis on inculcation of the mystery doctrine of the church age. What does that mean? Mystery is mysterion in the Greek, and that has to do with the unique age in which we live in the church age in which we learn these things from Scripture, and it should be priority number one. And that's why I'm going to be here Friday at 6 o'clock and then another one at 7.15, and that's the way it's going to be. And I'll be here, and if nobody shows up, I'll teach to at least one or two people. So, uh, and then you see the arrow goes to concentration on priority number one. And then you see Operation Z. Now, these are technical terms. And it's a vocabulary that's been designed so that you can understand these things. And you say, well, what is Operation Z? I'm an artist. <laughs> All right. You see the pastor. This is Operation Z right here. And you see the pastor teaches to the human spirit. And if you are willing to accept what the pastor has to say, that means positive volition. You say, yes, pastor, I understand that and I believe it. And then it is transferred by the Holy Spirit and becomes gnosis. And that's a Greek term which means academic knowledge. And then, the Holy, and then if you say, I believe that, the Holy Spirit will transfer that into your stream of consciousness. And we haven't studied the stream of consciousness yet, but I wanted to show you what Operation Z was, because it's on this one. Now, Operation Z. So, we know that that's the pastor teaching the uh, believer, and he believes it. And then it goes into epinosis, Greek for uh, spiritual understanding. And then you organize your life around priority number one. And that means you uh, stay in Bible class, or, or you can listen to Bible tapes, and you can learn the Word of God. And you avoid distractions. Of course, there are distractions. People, then you don't avoid people, but people can be a distraction to you. And uh, if, if uh, your social life, so to say, is uh, causing you to stay out of Bible class, well, then you're not focused on priority number one. And then you organize your thinking around the Word of God. And uh, some of these terms we haven't studied yet. They are, but uh, just understand that I'm trying to show you that priority number one is to learn the Word of God. And then we grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and that means we lose spiritual momentum. And eventually, we execute the plan of God and glorify God, and then we have maximum production, and that means divine good. Now, divine good, you can only have divine good when you are filled with God, the Holy Spirit. If you're under the sin nature, that's wood, hay, and stubble, as per 1 Corinthians, and that will be burned at uh, the Balaam. Now, invisible impact. Now, if you grow in grace, you have an invisible impact on your country, on your history, and you also have an impact on the angelic conflict, and we have yet not yet studied the angelic conflict, so some of this might be flying right over your head, but this is a basic series, so don't get discouraged. We'll get to all of these wonderful things in the future. So because it should be priority number one, I'm going to be here Friday, and we'll be talking about the crucifixion of our Lord, since it will be Good Friday. Now we left off with Hebrews 12, 5 through 6. Now let's get some points from that. And I had point one, which was the context is the general doctrine of divine discipline. Divine discipline is the sum of total of punitive measures by which God judges, corrects, and teaches the believer in time. Point two, divine discipline is confined to time. In other words, there's no such thing as purgatory. The Catholics believe in purgatory. There is no purgatory. Any divine discipline you receive, you will receive right here on this earth while you're alive. And if you believe in Christ, when you die, you go to be face to face with the Lord. As Revelation says, in a place of no more sorrow, no more tears, no more pain, no more death, the old things have passed away. So uh, there is no purgatory, and therefore all divine discipline is confined to our time on this earth while we are alive. We are alive. And this is found in Revelation 21.4 where it says when we die, there will be no more sorrow, no more tears, no more pain. Actually, it says in Revelation 21.4, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, 
neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the old things have passed away. So when you die as a believer, you go to heaven. And that is when all pain ends. Point three, divine discipline results from the believer from his own area of weakness and making his own bad decisions. All of us at some point make a bad decision. All of us at some point sin, and we are punished when we do so. But then we've been given a solution. We have an advocate, as it says in 1 John, and we also have 1 John 1, 9, which is very important for us as believers. As Lewis Berry Schaefer said, 1 John 1, 9 is the John 3, 16 of Christendom. In other words, by grace, we simply name our sins to God, and He is faithful, and that means He'll, he'll forgive you every time. And you say, well, I, I've committed this sin over and over and over again. And you probably have. But God is faithful, and we have to understand, you have to understand something about God. God is perfect. His plan is perfect. And do you know something? God is never shocked by what we do. And you say, well, I did something really, really terrible. He must be shocked. God knew everything that you have ever done in eternity past. That's the omniscience of God. He knows, he knows the knowable simultaneously in eternity past. He knew all about us, each and every one of us in eternity past. He knew every sin we would commit. He knew everything about us. So when we sin, and we shock ourselves when we sin at times, but God's not shocked. He knew about it. And therefore, He gave us a solution. And the solution is 1 John 1, 9. In the Bible, if we name our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing. And your King James Version says, if you confess your sins, well, confess means to name. Look it up in the English Dictionary. That's what it means. All right. So what was I on point? Now I'm on point three. Divine discipline results from the believer from his own area of weakness making his own bad decisions. Point four. Certain sins are worse as far as divine discipline is concerned. And you say, well, I think all sin is the same. Well, as we studied in Proverbs chapter 6, there are seven sins which God abhors, and those are the seven worst sins, and we went over that. And if you're interested at all in uh, what, what, what has been taught in this ministry, I have over there a stack of MP3s, and you can just grab one free of charge, of course, and go listen. And if not, so be it. Point four, certain sins are worse as far as divine discipline is concerned. The sins of the tongue, that means gossip, maligning, and judging. The sins of the tongue bring triple compound discipline. And we noted that in Matthew 7, 1 through 2. Matthew chapter 7, 1 through 2. And we know this because we just completed a study of the sins of the tongue, of gossip, of maligning, of judging. And a lot of believers think they can get away with gossiping about the Lord's children. We are the Lord's children. Our master is the Lord Jesus Christ. The judge is the Lord Jesus Christ. When we stick our nose in other people's business, and when we say, you are doing thus and so wrong, when we do that, we are acting as judge. We are blaspheming our Lord. Our Lord was judged for every sin we have ever committed in human history on the cross. And as he was hanging, he, hanging there on the cross in excruciating pain, and as our sins were being imputed to him, he screamed out, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he knew why he was being forsaken. He was being forsaken for you and for me. He was being forsaken, and all of our sins were put on him and judged. So when we judge another believer, when Christ has already been judged for those sins, we are out of line, and God will punish us severely for doing so. And if you're involved in those types of sin, what do you do? 1 John 1, 9. And that's because God is gracious. And how can God be gracious? Because He did the ultimate thing on the cross. If He can be so gracious in doing that thing on the cross, then how gracious can He be in your spiritual life? Extremely. So therefore, point or certain sins are worse as far as divine discipline is concerned, found in Matthew 7, 1 through 2. Can I ask a question? Uh, we can hold off questions until the end. And then after, uh, after I finish uh, with this message, you can ask all the questions you want. You feel like it. All right. For the believer out of fellowship, there are three stages of divine discipline. There is warning discipline. That's found in Revelation 20. And that means the Lord knocks lightly on your door. And he says, 
and that what he's doing is he's giving you a little taste of punishment, trying to wake you up out of your sin, whether that be sins of legalism, which means gossip, judging, maligning, or whether they be other sins, such as fornication and adultery, and those type sins. And then if you remain under the sin nature, under the control of the sin nature, then he knocks harder. And that means he's disciplining, disciplining, disciplining you even harder. And then finally, if you never wake up, you have dying discipline. And that's found in 1 John 5.16, which uh, states, talks about the sin face to face with death. And it actually says not to pray for those believers who are dying the sin face to face with death. And that's what it says in the Bible. Now I have an illustration here. We've been over this before. But I see a lot of new faces, so uh, we'll, we'll go through this. Now, when you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you have an eternal relationship. You are put into union with Christ forever. And that's found in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. We have eternal security. And that means we cannot lose our salvation. To say that we can lose our salvation is to say that Christ did not do enough on the cross. It is to blaspheme our Lord to say we can lose our salvation. And you say, but people commit horrible sins. Of course they do. Within the members of our body is the old sin nature. And it's not an excuse to sin. There is no excuse to sin. And that is not what eternal security says. This is the grace of God. And if you don't understand grace, you're at the wrong place. Because the grace of God, Jesus Christ, I've, I've got to tell you this again, He was judged on the cross for your sins. They were imputed to you. And they were judged by Him. What can you do? Can you even come close to doing something like that? No! You can't even get close to it. It's grace. And you think you can, if you think you can lose your salvation, that means you think you can work your way into heaven. Because if you lose it, you have to work to gain it. And it's a gift. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says it's a gift. It is by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now, when you get a Christmas gift, have you ever worked for it? Somebody gives you a Christmas gift, you say, thank you, now let me mow your grass. No, it's free. It's free. And this is what it is. When you believe in Christ, it's free, and you're there, and you're in an eternal relationship. And it's found throughout Scripture. And in 2 Timothy, it talks about how we are eternally secure. And then, what happens is, we have a spiritual life to live. And we live that through the filling of God the Holy Spirit. 1 John 1, 7, 8, and Ephesians 5, 18. And this is temporal. Because we're not always going to be in fellowship with our Lord. At times, we are going to sin. And when we do so, we will move out and move into carnality. And carnality is described in, that's hard to see, 1 Corinthians 8, 1 through, uh, 1 Corinthians 3, 1 actually. Wait, for carnality, that's kind of blurry. 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 8. 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 8 is carnality. And this is when we walk in darkness as believers. And this is when the Lord starts mocking and starts punishing you. And he's saying, get back into fellowship. How do you do that? Rebound. 1 John 1, 9. And back into this circle we go. Now we're always in this circle. We can never get out of that circle. We are always saved. And then this circle, we can go in and out. In and out. When we sin, we're out. And then, but uh, you know what most believers do today? They're eternally saved, but they live out here because they're so full of self-righteousness and they're so full of themselves thinking that they're holy that they, 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 they're blinded by their own arrogance. And they can't even tell that they're arrogant. And they're living out here in perpetual carnality. And they will die to sin face to face with death. And they won't even know what hit them. And it's a sad thing. But if people listen to grace, maybe they can get out of that. So, point five. For the believer out of fellowship, there are three stages of discipline. Warning discipline, Revelation 3.20. Intensive discipline, Psalms 32, 1-5. And Psalms 118, 17-18. And then there's dying discipline, the sin face-to-face -face with death, which is, of course, found in 1 John 5.16. And we also have Revelation 3.16, which states, Therefore, because you are lukewarm, and neither cold. What does cold mean? That is somebody who has not believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. Nor hot. And what does hot mean? 
that belief, you are not hot for the Word of God. Uh, you might be hot for self-righteousness. You might be hot for uh, your own holiness. But you're not hot for the Word of God. It means you don't care about what the Bible says. And uh, so, uh, if you're hot, you're concerned about what the Bible has to say. And you take this into your soul. So, Philippians 3, 18 through 19. For many keep walking concerning whom I have... This is the Apostle Paul. For many keep walking concerning whom I have communicated many times, and now I keep on communicating, even though weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose termination is ruin, whose God is what? Whose God is their emotion, whose fame is by means of dishonor, who keep on thinking about earthly things. Where is emotion? Emotion is in your body. And the Apostle Paul is rebuking believers, people who have already believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. And why does he say, who the, your Bible makes, might say, whose God is their belly? Well, in the, uh, in the uh, Greek, the belly was used, and they didn't have psychological terms as we have today. And this is talking about emotion. And if you have an NIV or a different translation, it might say emotion. And people who make emotion their God, they work themselves up, lather themselves up in emotion, and they think they're spiritual because of that. What does the Bible say? It says you must have the mind of Christ or the thinking of Christ. Does it say you must have the emotion of Christ? No! And how do you get the thinking of Christ? By learning the Bible. By learning the Word of God. That's how you do it. And that's what you put in your soul. So, so point one. So this is, uh, if you're in pain or if you're dying, this does not mean you're dying to sin face to face with death necessarily. Because there are two categories of suffering. There is suffering for discipline as a teaching aid for us. And... Uh, and, and if we ignore it, the discipline gets harder and harder. And you know you're under this discipline because it's unbearable. We know that God will not give us anything that we cannot bear according to Scripture. But that's if we're in fellowship. If we're out of fellowship, that becomes unbearable. And that's for us to get back in line. Point two. Suffering for blessing, on the other hand, is bearable. That is bearable pain. And it accelerates our spiritual growth by helping you apply the Word of God to the situation. And we see, in fact, that God will not give us more than we can handle if we are in fellowship. Now, there's a term that I'm going to give you that you probably haven't heard yet. The sin face to face with death is related to reversionism. Now, a lot of churches today would call that backsliding or something like that. But it's going reverse in the spiritual life. And you're going backwards. And you need to go forward. And you move forward by learning the Word of God. And therefore, the, the term reversionism is coined. And it is defined as maladjustment to the justice of God. And there are stages to reversionism. And while you might not know this terminology yet, I'm going to expose it to you. And the more exposure you get to the terminology, the more that you'll get a grasp of it. And uh, right now, just know that reversionism means that you're going in reverse in your spiritual life. You're not going forward. And there are stages to what would be called reversionism, or as is called in churches today, backsliding. And that would be point one. You react to the Word of God. You react to accurate Bible teaching. You react to it. You hear something about grace, you don't like it. You've never heard anything like this before in your life. And it just gets all over your nerves and you don't like it. And you're ready to just chew me out. Well, I'm going to give it to you straight. I don't care if you're going to chew me out or not. I'm giving you the Word of God. And I stand before the Lord. And if I'm doing something wrong, He punishes me. I stand before Him. And, uh, and uh, you know, we'll see. Reaction to Bible teaching or distraction. If you're distracted, that means you're distracted by other things in life, such as social life, or you're distracted by something else, in which you're not getting the Word of God. And you're not putting the Word of God in your soul. And what happens then is you go into a frantic search for happiness. You're looking for happiness. Because the key to your happiness is in the Word of God. That's the key to your happiness. It's not in anything else. And so if you reject the Word of God, you're going to go out and look for all kinds of happiness in all different ways. And people in their sin natures do different things 
at di in different ways to find happiness. Some people find happiness by being extremely self-righteous. Some people find happiness by thinking they are extremely a spiritual, and that's how they act. And they think they get that frantic search for happiness. That's not normal. And then other people have a different tendency in which they uh, go to bars, get drunk, or go to a strip club, and that's their frantic search for happiness. But both areas are sin. On the one hand, you have people who uh, think they're so holy and so great. And on the other hand, you have people running around raising hell, as they say. And both are sin. Both are sin. Which one's worse? The people over here. Why? Because they can't see it. They don't know they're in sin. They can't tell that they're in sin. It's called blind arrogance. And what did Jesus say about them? You scribes, Pharisees, and hypocrites. That's what Jesus thought about them. And he talked about them as the blind, leading the blind, and they both, and they all, fall in a ditch. Point three is Operation Boomerang. When you go out and you search for happiness in these ways, uh, it comes back to haunt you, and you realize there's no happiness in all of that. And uh, we won't study this part of reversion. There's uh, uh, four more points to this, but we're not going to study this yet because this is a basic series, and that's not a basic doctrine. The sin face to face with death means shame at the judgment seat of Christ with failure to receive your blessings. Now we have blessings stored up for us in heaven on deposit right now. And if you execute the unique spiritual life, that is, if you learn the Word of God and put it in your souls, there's a crown of righteousness, a crown of glory for pastors only, and there are other rewards. There is uh, the, the star, the, the morning star, and other rewards that you receive as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ who executes the plan of God. But if you do not execute the plan of God, you're still saved. You'll go to heaven. But when you stand before the Lord Jesus Christ at the Bema, He'll say, what did you do with the unique spiritual life? And uh, you won't have anything to answer. And then uh, you will feel ashamed in heaven. And that's an oxymoron. You'll be happy, but at the same time, ashamed because you did not go the full way. You did not maximize your spiritual life. So maximum punitive action of dying to sin face to face with death does not imply that the believer will be miserable after death because there is no more sorrow, no more tears, no more pain, and no more death for all believers who are face to face with the Lord. Now there are case histories of believers who have faced the sin face to face with death, and this is found in Scripture. There were certain believers in Philippi who faced the sin face to face with death. That's found in Philippians 3. 18 through 19. There were certain believers in the church of Laodicea, and that's found in Revelation 3, 16. And we noted King Saul. King Saul fell on his own sword. King Saul committed suicide as one who had believed in Christ in the order of Abraham. And how do we know he went to heaven even though he committed suicide? Because Samuel told him, This day you will be with me in paradise. In other words, even the believer who commits suicide goes to heaven. And you say, that's shocking. Oh, is it? Look it up in the Bible in uh, 2 Samuel. Or 1st or 2nd. It's in 1st or 2nd Samuel. And Saul fell on his own sword. And he committed suicide. And Samuel told him, this day you will be with me, both you and your son." Now, how is that possible? Grace! Do you not understand grace? Do you not understand that the Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross for every sin you have ever committed, including the sin of suicide? Now, how holy do you think you are? Just how holy do you think you are that you think you can get into heaven by what you do or by what you don't do? I've never committed suicide, therefore I'm going to heaven. It's not about you. It's about what Christ did on the cross. I hope I make myself clear, and I'm shouting this way because your soul is in jeopardy. Your soul is in jeopardy if you do not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. If it's not faith alone in Christ alone, your soul is in jeopardy of hell. And that's what the Scripture tells us. We know that King Saul fell on his own sword, and, and he was even involved in sorcery. King Saul got involved 
in sorcery. He went to the Witch of Endor. And we noted all of this in the basic series. And I'm disappointed I have to go back over it. But some people need a little kick every now and then so that they realize what's wrong with them in their souls because they're not going to get it anywhere else. Point five. King Hezekiah had an evil foreign policy of going to Egypt for help. So God put him under the sentence, face to face with death. However, he rebounded. In other words, he utilized what would be comparable to 1 John 1 9. And they didn't have that in the Old Testament, but David acknowledged his sins to God when he committed adultery. Another thing, you think you're so holy? David, a man after God's own heart, what did he do? He committed adultery. And what else did he do? He committed murder. And what's the Bible say about David? He is a man after God's own heart. And you say, well, yes, but the Bible says he lost the joy of his salvation. He lost the joy. He didn't lose the salvation. He lost the joy of it. And of course he did because he lost the joy because he was in sin. He committed murder. He committed adultery. Believers can do this. People who believed in Christ have sin natures. Jesus, your sin nature is not eradicated. We become sinless when we die. And then we're sinless. Only then are we sinless. We always sin. 1 John 1.8 and 1 John 1.10 make that very, very, very clear. And what does it say? If you think you're without sin, what does the Bible say there? It says, you make God out to be a liar. So we have to understand, we have to get real and understand that we are sinners and saved by grace and we are saved by faith alone in Christ alone. And that's what we have to get through our thick skulls. And they are thick sometimes, but once it clicks in your head, once you understand that it's faith alone in Christ alone, that is the moment of your salvation and that is the moment of eternal life for you. 1 Corinthians 11, 27 through 28, 30 and 31 describe participating in communion service in a state of carnality resulting in the sin face to face with death. Now, 1 Corinthians, what does the first chapter of 1 Corinthians say? It says the Corinthians were what? They were sanctified. What does that mean? Saved. They were saved. Yet, what were they doing at communion? They were getting drunk at communion. And that's all found there. They got drunk at communion. There was one man having sex with his mother. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And about the whole chapter deals with him having sex with his mother, which is a shocking sin. Yet, what does the Bible say? Sanctify! They were sanctified. And why? Because Jesus Christ died as a substitute for all of those sins. He's sanctified by grace. We have to get down to the level of grace. And if you think you can work your way into heaven, or you think you can go to heaven by what you do not do, then you are then you are sorely, sorely mistaken. Uh, point seven. We noted the case of Ananias and Sapphira, and that's found in Acts five one through ten. Acts five one through ten, and we studied this before. And this is where Ananias and Sapphira were trying to get ahead in the church. What they did, well, they saw Barnabas lay a whole bunch of money at the feet of Peter. Actually, Barnabas took everything he owned, sold all his land, and dumped it right at the feet of Peter. And then Ananias and Sapphira saw this in the church, and they said, well, this guy's getting all kind of praise and glory for what he did. Why? Why, we should do something like that so the people in the church will pat us on the back. So they did. But they, so what they did is they sold their property, and they were very wealthy. They sold all their property, and they went and they gave even a bigger pile, and they threw it in front of uh, Peter. But they had held back some. Now, the issue wasn't that they held back some. The issue was that they were trying to get attention from the church. Now, it was their property. They could have gave a penny if they wanted to. That's not the issue. They could have gave ten bucks, twenty bucks, if they had. But what they were doing is they wanted to get some attention from the people in the church. So they gave only part of it, and they kept part. Now they could have went to Peter and said, "Look, I'm giving you part of this money. I need the other part to feed my family." And that's fine. Those who don't take care of their families are called infidels in the scripture, or as infidels. They could be believers not taking care of their families. But they could, he could have said, I'm keeping part of this to take care of my family. But here you go, Peter. 
but they, but they didn't. They lied. They said, I'm giving you all that I own. And they did that for attention. Everything that I own, I'm giving to the church. And then, uh, well, Peter knew what, what, what they were up to. And in fact, this is called lying against the Holy Spirit. And Ananias and Sapphira dropped dead. Now that's the sin face to face with death. Now, they didn't drop dead just from that sin. They had been in a state of carnality for years and years. They had been in the church seeking approval from people for years and years and years. And then suddenly it caught up with them when they went up to Peter. And finally, uh, the Lord took them out and they dropped dead and they went to heaven. Point eight is the case of Hymenius and Alexander, and that's found in 1 Timothy 1, 19 through 20. And they lived in perpetual carnality. So you see the issue in the Christian way of life is to rebound, that means use 1 John 1, 9, and to disregard those things that are behind. You must use 1 John 1, 9 and keep moving. For if you fail to utilize 1 John 1, 9, you put yourself in danger of dying the sin face to face with death as found in 1 John 5, 16. Now we have 10 minutes and we're going to begin a doctrine of anger. Now, anger is a sin. A lot of people don't know that, and I'm shocked by the number of people who don't know that anger is a sin. Uh, righteous indignation is not a sin, but anger is a sin. And if you're blinded to that sin, and you don't know that it's a sin, well, it's kind of like, if I've told this story before, uh, please forgive me, but I don't think I have. One time, my cousin, when he was 10 years old, he got his first dirt bike. And he was riding it around and enjoying it. And they found this wonderful, flat piece of land in Sparta. <coughs> and it's, it's a little hilly, so it's kind of hard to find just this flat piece of land. And it was flat. And it was muddy because it had just rained. And he got his dirt bike. And meow, him and his friends were running across there with his dirt bike. And there was about a rooster tail going up maybe 100 feet behind it of just, just the mud, you know. And it's splattering all over. And they're having a grand old time. And they're going across there over and over again. And they do this for about an hour. And then uh, my uncle was there with them. And uh, he started looking around. And he looked and he saw this green sign. And it said, Spartanburg Sewer System. <laughs> <laughs> what they were doing was riding their bikes through crap. And it was all over them. Yet they didn't know it. And that's what anger's all about. If you get angry, well, that's a stupid sin, by the way, because there's you're too emotional to understand what you're doing when you're angry, and that's why you say things and hurt people when you don't really mean it. So uh, it's like having crap all over you and not understand, not knowing it. But when they found out about it, first thing they did is get that hose. And, <laughs> middle of winter time, they don't care. <laughs> Freezing to death, but they get it off of them. So what happened, it's the same with anger, and it's the same with a lot of things. You might have lived your whole life as a self-righteous person, as somebody who uh, thinks you're holy when you really don't know anything about Scripture, and you think you're so holy and you use the right language and everything else, yet you're covered in crap and you don't even know it. But as soon as you find out about it, the first thing you should do, wash yourself off. How do you do that? First John 1, 9. If you name your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you your sins, and to purify you from all wrongdoing. So it's the same with all sins. If we're unaware of them, it's like being covered in manure and not even knowing it. And uh, that's why you need to learn the doctrine of sin. That's why you need to know what is all in, what is involved in sin. And we've been studying sin for the past couple weeks now. And that's because there's a lot to do with harmardiology. And that is the technical theological term for sin. And that's what we need to know about. So with the few minutes we have left, let's take down just a few points on anger. And uh, let's get a definition of anger. Anger is a mental attitude sin, and it's used many times as an anthropopathism. You say, what in the world is that? Well, that's God assigning to himself a human attribute that he does not have. And you say, God was angry with them, so he smoked them. Well, that's something we can understand. But God has never been angry. God is always happy. But in order to communicate something to us, he says, I am angry with you. But he's not. 
It's just something so we can relate. We can't relate to perfect happiness all the time. And that's God. God is always happy. If God were angry every time somebody did something wrong, well, he would be mad. He would be he would be like a madman running around heaven because there are billions of people in this earth sinning every day. But God is happy, and you have to understand that. And if you're sitting here miserable and you don't like uh, what you're hearing, uh, well, that's fine. Okay, anger is a mental attitude sin, but guess what? God's happy. You're sitting here miserable, vibrating, saying, I've never heard anything like this. Oh, I'm going to punch you in the face. Well, it's funny how people who are so full of love, you know, I know a lot of people that are so full of love, but then when you step on their toes with the Word of God, they get a sour expression on their face, and they look at you like, I can really tear you apart. What happened to your love? I love you in person. I love all of you in person. I have nothing against any of you. I'm just teaching you the Word of God. I'm not here to make anybody angry. But if it steps on your toes, don't take it from me. Take it from above. All right. As a mental attitude sin, anger expresses antagonism, hatred, exasperation, resentment, irrationality. It can be mental or emotional or both. And the Greek word orge refers to mental anger. That's O-R-G-E. Orge, that refers to a mental anger and if you hate something. And then thumos is an emotional anger. That's an irrational anger. And a lot of people at church can get an irrational anger for the pastor because they've never heard anything like this before. And then in Ephesians 4.31, there are both types, and they're both related to bitterness. Anger is a sin that motivates uh, honor code violations. And what's the honor code? Love thy neighbor as you love yourself. That's the honor code. That's the royal family honor code. By the way, we are a royal family of God. Every single one of us who has believed in the Lord Jesus Christ is royal family of God. And every royal family has an honor code. And we have an honor code to follow. Love thy neighbor as you love yourself. And you might not understand exactly what that means, but that's part of the royal honor code. But what is the violation of that honor code? Gossip. If you gossip about somebody, if you gossip about another member of royalty, you've violated the honor code. You're not treating them as you would like to be treated yourself, are you? Judging? You don't want to be judged, do you? Then why do you judge others? Maligning? You don't want to be maligned, so why do you malign others? So most of these sins result in chain sinning in which sin after sin is committed. And, uh, and anger is a mental attitude reaction. If you get angry, you're having a reaction to someone or something that has happened. And there's no place for reaction. We need to respond to the Word of God. That's what we need to do. And that's what it's all about. Now, uh, some people say, well, there's a justifiable anger. And uh, there are points in the Bible where Jesus turned the money tables over. That's called righteous indignation. But very few of us are spiritually mature enough to understand righteous indignation. Now, earlier, I raised my voice. That was righteous indignation. And why did I have righteous indignation? Because it's important. It's important to know that it's faith alone and Christ alone. It's important to know that you are saved, as Acts 16.31 says, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. It is important to know these things. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, if you are here this morning without Christ, without hope, and without eternal life, you have a gracious solution that has been given to you. Jesus Christ died on the cross as a substitute for you. And there's only one way of salvation. The scripture says that narrow is the way of salvation. And in fact, it's so narrow, there's only one way. And that way is John 3.15, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. John 3.16, for God loved the world so much that he gave his uniquely born son, so that anyone who believes in him shall never perish, but have eternal life. John 3.18, he who believes in him is not judged, but he who does not believe has been judged already, because he has not believed in the unique person of the Son of God. And notice that the word believe is repeated three times in that verse, and that's because that's the only way of salvation, that is to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. John 3.36, he who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not believe in the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. The issue in salvation is that you either believe in Christ once or you do not believe. And that choice is up to you. And it's private. It's a private matter between you and God. John 6.47 says, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me has eternal life. John 11.25, Jesus said to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me shall live, even if he dies. John 11.26, 
and everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. So while you're alive today, we don't know how long we're going to live. We could drop dead today, we could drop dead tonight, or it might be years from now. But while you're alive, that is the only chance you have to believe in Jesus Christ. There is no second chance. After you die, if you have not believed in Christ, or if you have believed in Christ and added something to that, then you are not saved. Because anything added to faith cancels faith, and that's found in Romans. And I'm not going to give you the verse right now, but it's there. So, it's up to you right now. It's up to you. You can simply believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and that is the moment of your salvation. You can say in all of it, Father, I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and that is the moment you will be saved. So, Father, thank you this morning for the opportunity that we have to study this portion of the Word. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us to these things, and may they be a blessing and a challenge to us, so that we might grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.